It is true that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. The latter do so out of love, knowing that I'm put here for the defence of the gospel. The former preach Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing they could stir up trouble for me while I'm in change, in chains. But what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached, and because of this, I rejoice. Yes, and I will continue to rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and God's provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. I eagerly expect and hope that I will be in no way ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. If I am to go on living in the body, This will mean fruitful labour for me. Yet what shall I choose? I do not know. I am torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. But it's more necessary for you that I remain in the body. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith, so that through my being with you again, your boasting in Christ Jesus will abound on account of me. So I have to confess, this is not a passage that I've ever paid much attention to before, So it's been good for me to unpick it and to study it in greater depth. I think I've loved the opening prayer that Paul does. And then I love chapter two with all that about Jesus. And this has almost just been the bit that goes in the middle. So I'm guilty of cherry picking, which is an awful thing to confess. (laughs) So just by way of introduction, it's two weeks since we last studied Philippians. So I'll do a brief recap Because after 14 sleeps, you might have forgotten what we learned from Jamie and from Ken. So the church in Philippi was founded by Paul, and it was the first church in Europe. Philippi was an important Roman colony and a very cosmopolitan city, yet it had no synagogue. So Paul spoke to what was effectively a ladies' prayer meeting down by the river, led by Lydia, a businesswoman. Lydia was the first Christian convert in Europe. Do you remember the vision Paul had of someone from Macedonia asking them to come over? Well, it might be said that the Macedonian man in Paul's vision turned out to be a woman. Paul had a very close, warm relationship with the believers in Philippi, and his letter to them gives us a glimpse of Paul the friend, caring for and nurturing the Philippian Christians. Paul wrote the letter while he was imprisoned in Rome and he wanted to reassure the Philippians and to answer their concerns. So there's three points I want us to consider. One, what did Paul's imprisonment mean for the spread of the gospel? Two, what did imprisonment mean for Paul personally? And three, what about us? What is this passage from scripture saying to us? So, what did Paul's imprisonment mean for the spread of the gospel? We know from Acts 28, verse 30, that Paul stayed in his own hired lodging in Rome, guarded by soldiers from the elite Praetorian Guard. He was actually chained to one or other of the soldiers 24-7, but he was allowed visitors and he could send and receive letters. So it was by this means that he found out about the great concerns his Christian friends in Philippi had for him. 
During Paul's time with them in Philippi, they had witnessed amazing examples of the sovereign power of God. Acts chapter 16, verses 11 to 40, relates how Paul and Silas were divinely released from prison and vindicated before the civil authorities. So it's not surprising that the Philippians wondered where the power of God was in Paul's current imprisonment. But Paul wanted them to know that God's power and blessing were still with him, even though he was in prison. He wanted them to know that far from putting an end to his missionary activity, the imprisonment had actually expanded it. Far from shutting the door to the spread of the gospel, the imprisonment opened a door to new areas of work and activity, which he would never otherwise have begun. The plot by the Jews in Jerusalem to silence Paul and put an end to his missionary activity had spectacularly backfired. And it had backfired in a number of ways. Paul was able to preach and talk to visitors, sharing the gospel with them and encouraging them to be confident, bold witnesses themselves. He witnessed to the Roman soldiers guarding him who were from the finest regiment in the Roman army and some of them became Christians. Incidentally, Christianity was first brought to Britain by Roman soldiers and it's not inconceivable that some of them had heard Paul preaching. It was during his time in prison that Paul wrote Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians. How many millions of lives have been impacted by these letters over the last 2,000 years, including us sitting here today? So Paul's time in prison achieved far more in terms of spreading the gospel than even he could have asked for or imagined. I've already mentioned how Paul's imprisonment was an incentive to preaching. This incentive worked two ways. There were those who loved Paul and knew that the best way to please him was to see that the work of the gospel did not suffer because of his absence. But there were others who preached out of selfish ambition. They wanted to surpass Paul in ministry and to promote their own name above his. They were glad that Paul was in prison because they saw it as an opportunity to advance their own influence, their own prestige, and their own church party. But as long as Christ was preached, Paul did not care who received the credit. He did not care what other preachers said about him or how contemptuous they were of him. All that mattered to Paul was that Christ was preached. Paul only objected if he thought a false gospel was being preached or a distraction a distorted gospel, even if from the best of motives. If Paul's imprisonment could not hinder the spread of the gospel, neither could the wrong motives of some preachers hinder its spread either. God was still get, God's work was still getting done, and as far as Paul was concerned, that was a cause for great rejoicing. We have here in Paul's imprisonment a lovely example of how God can redeem what others mean for harm. There are examples of this all the way through the Bible. Joseph provides us with a wonderful example in the Old Testament. Have you ever had the experience where a particular Bible story, Bible verse or a Bible character keeps popping up in your reading or in something you're watching on television? I think it's God's way of drawing our attention to something he wants us to learn. Three years ago, it was Job who kept popping up for me. I have a lot of respect for Job, but I can't say that I particularly enjoyed his company. But over the last few months, Joseph has kept popping up. And it so happens we are following the story of Joseph in Connect for You on Friday mornings. And it's proving to be very popular. It's such a well-known story that I don't need to retell it. What Joseph's brothers meant for harm, what Potiphar's wife meant for harm, God used to achieve his purposes. And his purpose was to take a spoiled brat of a teenager and make him prime minister of the then most powerful empire in the world. God used Joseph's circumstances 
to train him to become the means of saving that part of the world from a devastating famine. And more importantly, he was the means of preserving God's people. Without their subsequent 400 year stay in Egypt, God's people would have been assimilated into the surrounding pagan nations, instead of which they grew into a nation that God would use. A door apparently closing is never the end of influence, achievement or ministry. Paul's imprisonment did not mean the end of his influence, achievement or ministry. So what did imprisonment mean for Paul personally? Paul knew that God was in control of all events, even though his imprisonment and pending trial before Nero made the situation look very dark. He trusted God with his welfare, knowing he had two great supports. First, he had the prayer support of his friends in Philippi. Paul had the humility to know that he needed the prayers of his friends. And secondly, he had the support of the Holy Spirit. The presence of the Holy Spirit is the fulfillment of the promise of Jesus that he will never leave us or forsake us. Paul trusted God that he would not be ashamed because he knew he was in the center of God's will and he was not being punished through the adversity he was experiencing at this time. He also knew that in Christ, he would find the courage to never be ashamed of the gospel, but would seize every opportunity to preach it. He also trusted that Jesus would be glorified, whether by his life or by his death. If Jesus were to decide that Paul could best glorify him by laying down his life, then this is what Paul would do. This must have been hard for the Philippians who had seen God do so many remarkable miracles of deliverance in Paul's life while he was with them in Philippi. It would have been easy for them to associate God's glory only with being delivered from problems, not in being delivered in the midst of problems. Paul knew that death was not a defeat for the Christian and he did not fear death. He knew it was a graduation to glory and a net gain for him. His death for the cause of Christ would glorify Jesus, as well as ushering him into the immediate presence of Jesus. Knowing that his death could be a gain for both the gospel and for him personally, Paul was torn between being with the Lord or continuing to minister to the Philippians and others. He knew that people still needed him and that his work was not yet done. So while allowing for the possibility of martyrdom, he told the Philippians that he expected to be spared at this time. Even the great apostle Paul did not have a prophet certainty about the future. In the event Paul did survive this two year imprisonment, he was set free and was later martyred in Rome. And he did come to visit the Philippians again. Again, the plot to silence Paul backfired because he would not be deterred from preaching the gospel through fear of death. Whether Paul lived or died was up to God, not him. Paul can only do what God wills him to do. Paul only wants to glorify God. In 1984, I read a book called Affliction by Edith Schaefer the wife of Francis Schaeffer, a world-renowned evangelical Christian. And the book is basically a theology of suffering. And in it, Edith describes a dream she had. She dreamed she was in heaven and an angel was showing her around. He took her into a beautiful building, which was like an art gallery, but it had just two rooms. In one room, there were pictures depicting the answered prayers of individual Christians. In the other room were pictures depicting apparently unanswered prayers of individual Christians. The angel explained to Edith that each Christian had pictures in each room. There were pictures showing wonderful answers to prayer in terms of miraculous healings, deliverance, provision, and so on. And there were pictures where these things had not happened. Pictures where loved ones had died instead of being healed. 
where people endured hardship, poverty or persecution, where at the same time they received God's grace and strength to endure and persevere. When Edith questioned the angel as to why some prayers are answered and some are apparently not, the angel replied that it all had to do with God's glory. It was God's glory that determined the outcome to prayer. Shortly after reading this book, something happened which made me think again about God's glory and prayer. David Watson, a leader in the charismatic movement, became terminally ill with cancer. There was virtually a worldwide movement of prayer amongst Christians on his behalf. The motivation for this outpouring of prayer was not only compassion for the man and his family, but also the thought was that his healing from cancer would bring great glory to God. There was much talk in the media about this and interviews with David himself. John Wimber and his team flew in from America and spoke prophetically of David's healing, as did many other Christian leaders. So it came as a huge shock to all these Christians when David Watson died. Shortly before he died, David gave an interview on TV in which he described his battle with faith during his illness and he described how he had eventually come to the same place as Paul and could say, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. He had come to the place of only wanting to glorify God, whether that was by living or dying was up to God. After his death, and with the thoughts of Edith Schaefer's book still fresh in my mind, I thought David's trust in God during the dark times of his illness and his calm acceptance of God's will was what brought the greater glory to God, as did the continuing faith and trust of all those Christians who were so disappointed that their prayers were not answered in the way they had hoped. Both David Watson and Paul had pictures in both rooms in heaven's prayer gallery as they sought to live lives that brought glory to God. And so we come to our final point, what about us? What does all this mean for us? Once we become Christians and members of the church, we can bring either glory or shame to God by our life and our speech, our conduct. So let's just focus on the glory side of things. Bringing glory to God is a huge topic given the nature of the society in which we live. A society that is in active denial of the Christian roots which form the foundation of Western civilization. And a society with which we are going to be increasingly in conflict with. I'm going to focus down even more to just one thing, to prison. Paul was in prison because of his faith in Jesus. It brought him into conflict with the prevailing society. Many thousands of Christians are languishing in prisons because their faith in Jesus has brought them into conflict with their prevailing society. And it's not beyond the realms of possibility that our prevailing society may one day decide to rid itself of nuisance Christians by putting them in prison. During one of my prayer times last week, I was thinking about Christians being in prison because of their faith. And I felt God say to me, Christians in prison have spirits that soar. That was certainly true of Paul. Within the confines of prison, his spirit certainly soared. And we have the written evidence in our Bibles. Ephesians, Philippians and Colossians are riches that have come down to us out of the darkness of Paul's prison experience. I'm reminded of Isaiah chapter 45, verse 3, where God says, I will give you the treasures of darkness, riches stored in secret places. One of the ways we can bring glory to God is by supporting our brothers and sisters in prison because of their faith in Jesus. This is exactly what the Philippian Christians did. Completely off their own back, they had a collection for Paul and sent Epaphroditus with this gift of money to Paul and also assured Paul of their prayers. We too can pray 
and send gifts of money. We can also sign online petitions to support persecuted Christians and email RMP. If you get material from Open Doors, you get lots of information about what's going on worldwide, how you can help and how you can email your MP. In fact, recently I've sent quite a few emails to Helen Morgan. I think she must open her inbox and think, oh no, it's that woman from Whitchurch again. <laughs> the other week it was something on behalf of um, persecuted Christians in Nigeria which I sent an email to her. And she does actually reply to your emails. And she replied to this one, telling me that she was forwarding my letter to the relevant person in the Foreign Office. So I got a nice long letter from them, all about what the government is hoping to do and to achieve. Whether they do it or not, at least it's flagged up that they've got constituents that know what's going on and expect them to do something about it. Whenever I'm tempted to discouragement because of the smallness of what I can do compared with the enormity of the suffering of some of these believers, I remember the feeding of the 5,000. Jesus took the small amount of food on offer and in his hands it became enough to feed a multitude. He can take the smallness of our offerings on behalf of our persecuted family and use it to accomplish far more than we could ever ask or imagine. And if you ever read the material from Open Doors, you'll know how much these Christians really value our prayers, and how there are times when they're in deep despair, and suddenly their spirits are lifted, and they know it's because someone is praying for them. During that same prayer time, I thought about other Christians who are also in prison, though not a literal prison, in fact, it was these Christians who were the main focus of my thoughts. Christians whose lives are constrained and made small by ill health, financial worries, age, family circumstances. But even in these circumstances, we can have spirits that soar and bring glory to God. Our spirits can soar during our times of prayer and our intercessions can become more effective. Our spirits can soar during worship and not only delight God, but impact the people around us. We may never know until we get to heaven what comfort, courage and inspiration people draw from our words and our worship. The very circumstances of our particular prison may well be the means God is using to refine and purify us to shape and to mould us into being more like Jesus. I am sure our faith and trust during these difficult times is very precious in God's eyes and is also a tremendous witness to those around us. We must never think that our lives are too small and too confined to be used by God for his glory. God delights to use the small things and the weak things to achieve his purpose for then the glory goes to him. I get an online magazine called Prophecy Today. And the other week, the, one of the ladies who was an editor, she resigned from her position there for personal reasons. And she wrote a final article. And she closed the article with this, which I thought was lovely. And it's what I would like to close with. She says, whatever goes on in this world, our main focus needs to be Jesus, his presence, his kingdom, his reign. Philippians 4, chapter 8 tells us, Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about these things. The passage means, first of all, focusing on Jesus himself. It means appreciating and thinking all we have to be grateful for, all he has given us. It means seeking his peace and joy, learning as Paul did, to be content in all circumstances. And it means looking for where he is at work. He is at work. We must seek to know him in all that we do. Whatever darkness we come across in our own lives or in the world around us, we must bring everything to him. And lastly, 
We need to seek to know what he would have us do, to know what our part is in his plan to bring light into darkness. Amen.